This is SFNet Presents In The Know with host Barry Bobro, sponsored by Hillco Global. Welcome, everybody, to the next episode of the In The Know podcast. I'm your host, Barry Bobro. Today, we're going to tackle one of the problems that it seems to be in the news, not just once a day, but about 50 times a day, supply chain, uh, with a, with a, a conversation that, that we're calling uh, those pesky supply chain issues are still here and they keep evolving. And my guest today is Steve Tanzi, the president of Hilco Performance Solutions. Uh, I'll let Steve talk a little bit more about himself, but he's got over 25 years of industry and consulting experience supporting companies with their transformational efforts using his knowledge of supply chain. Steve is a good Midwesterner, just like me. Uh, why don't we bring Steve on here? Well, Barry, thank you for having me on your, your podcast today and, and excited about talking Welcome. Uh, about the supply chain issues. I know it's on top of mind of many of uh, of uh, folks that are out there today. Absolutely. Steve, talk a little bit about what you're doing uh, uh, in your in your role at, at Hilco, what kinds of situations you're being brought into and and what you what you're doing with those. Yeah, so uh, the Hilco Performance Solutions uh, consultancy uh, really focuses on the, the middle market and in, in manufacturing, uh, companies, you know, we call it the commercial and industrial. So we work uh, with uh, you know consumer products companies and, and and manufacturing companies. And what we define as the middle market, which is kind of companies that have revenues from twenty million dollars up to a billion dollars. And really, where we specialize is is really helping uh, those those companies really you know improve their supply chain function and really you know turn the supply chain function into what we call you know a revenue generation. A center, right? Because you know, if you effectively manage your your supply chain, you can really increase the profitability. So our clients are all in the in the manufacturing space, and and over the the past couple of years, as we all know, have experienced some extreme issues, and we're working with them to to, to weather the storm here and really get ahead and and out in front of it, and really helping them improve their bottom line. Great. Well, let, let's let's dive right into it. So in your in your current practice, the companies you're seeing. What, what do you think are the, uh, uh, the key issues facing uh, all of your customers or, or basically the economy as we know it from a supply chain standpoint? Well, it's it's been unique in, in my career. You you typically see you know industri industry segments kind of struggle from time to time, but really, right, what we're seeing now is in manufacturing a, a really you know a, a deep struggle, and and it goes from you know just about every aspect of the of the supply chain, starting with labor. Right, labor has become a real issue in order to get labor, and then you know with the inflationary pressures and and what people are calling the great resignation. The cost of that labor is skyrocketing. You know, just material availability. If you think about you know key raw materials for different companies, you know, you look at at your energy. You look at at things that are coming from China, where a lot of of your base manufacturing is what has been done. And you look at things like you know the computer chips and, and things. All of these things are really becoming an issue. And anything that's tied to, to energy, your chemicals, plastics, all that sort of stuff, is really creating issues. The management of transportation, getting getting goods and services around the around the country and really around the world has become a bit of an issue. And then just managing inventory and your working capital. You know what what should you have? What shouldn't you have? And when should you have it? Has really become an issue. So when you think about your supply chain challenges, you know all the fundamental areas: your labor, your material availability, your inventories, and your transportation are really becoming a, a challenge and affecting the the environment that we're seeing today. Well, let, let's take them apart a little bit. Um, you, know, you mentioned the, the the labor issues. You know what what's being done to uh, to address? It? I, th I assume you're talking about labor uh, in the in the in the transportation side of it in particular, or or is it in the manufacturing as well? Well, in in everywhere, right? You know, you look at at transportation. Uh, you know, you, you'll see that you know you're driving down the road, and all the trucks have on the back of their truck, you know, hiring you know drivers yeah, exactly. for X yeah. amount of dollars, right? So so you know there is a driver shortage, right? And there was a bit of a driver shortage even before we went into COVID, right? It was something that was being recognized as as a as a profession that maybe wasn't filling as quickly as some of the others. So this has been an ongoing issue and 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 COVID has really exasperated that 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 particular issue. But even on the manufacturing floor, if you can get a job in California for $22 an hour at a McDonald's, 
Are you going to work in a hot factory packing stuff into boxes mm -hmm. at $14.50 an hour? Probably not. So your manufacturers are seeing incredible increase in terms of, of trying to attract labor. And there's a lot of competition out mm -hmm. there for, for that, that labor. And so, you know, you see, you know, when you're going down the highway again and you're looking at in, in, in factories, you're, everyone's hiring and everyone's offering, you know, bonuses and things like that to get that talent into their factory. Because as we know, demand is, is at, at, at a high for a lot of these manufacturers and they just can't find the labor to run right. the, the machinery. Right, and and despite the uh, uh, despite the everybody knows that uh, the, the economy is softening, we still have a very tight labor market, and it just seems a zero sum game for for bidding talent away from 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 any other job. Talk talk a little bit about energy uh, prices and how they're pushing through, because we have seen energy prices come down. Is that is that helping at all uh, of late? So it's helped in the transportation area, right? So you know, we, you know, if you look at like diesel fuel pricing, you know, it was getting up to almost you know six dollars a gallon here here recently, you know, in in early uh, you know uh, uh, July and late July, and it's it started to come down, right? We're, we're seeing it getting closer to sort of five dollars a gallon, but even you know just recently it started to spike back up, and and so for 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 those that that are using you know transportation, the fuel prices have spiked and are way higher than they were you know earlier or last year so it's it's still a bit of an issue and then when you think about you know your manufacturing companies you know natural gas is becoming an issue and if you think about looking at it in the future with the ukraine conflict that's going on and, and all the, the 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 things that are happening with russian gas into europe you know it's spiked as high as 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 nine dollars per you know according to to Henry Hub and and right now it's at eight dollars and fourteen cents and we're talking last year it was you know at four dollars uh, 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 per per therm so it's really mm -hmm. becoming an interesting sort of dynamic and you know it may get worse before it gets better especially for manufacturers that are in Europe you know that are are in, in you know that use natural gas to to do their boilers and and and, and heat their plants so it's yeah, going to be yeah. an interesting environment for it's sure it's going to be a very interesting winter for sure uh, we could we could digress into that but i but but over the last i don't know 10 or 20 years companies have systematically moved their manufacturing supply chains over to asia as you mentioned base manufacturing so much from there and now you have the the COVID impact and the and the shutdowns going on in China. How 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 much is that affecting uh, your your clients' uh, supply chain business? Well, I'll say that you know you 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 you're bringing goods uh, from China right back in September of of last year to get a container on the water was over twenty thousand dollars per container. Oof. Right right now. The, the prices on a container around, you know, just under six, seven thousand dollars at about six thousand six hundred and thirty two dollars per container. So the prices have come down. But if you think about, you know, pre COVID, some of those container prices were, you know, twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars per container. So, you know, we're still almost uh, a double what it was before the pandemic. But again, we're seeing it ease in terms of of of, of transportation costs. Mm -hmm. And and so like you know, what we've been advising clients is really to think about their supply chains. And you see a lot of people onshoring their manufacturing or coming into Mexico with some of their manufacturing. And we really encourage our clients to look at, at multiple sources, right? Don't just lock into China or into just Indonesia or Vietnam. You know, try to diversify so you have a multiple countries mm -hmm. that you're sourcing from. And where you can, have a domestic supplier. Yes, they may be a little bit higher, but you know that they're going to be there uh, when, when when, when things kind of get a little crazy mm -hmm. and, and lead times have just gone through the roof, right? And, and that's also creating an issue, not just the costs. So costs are still coming down, but lead times are still high because China is still, you know, experiencing lockdowns and things like that, where people are just not producing products as quickly as they were mm -hmm. pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. So are there, it, it sounds all gloom and doom, are there, who, who's benefiting from from the dislocation besides the uh, the companies that own the containers? Well, you know, the container manufacturer, the container companies are doing well uh, for sure and, and some of the transportation companies. But, you know, it de really depends on, on on the segment that you're in. So so companies that do have some more of their, their supply chain in the domestic sense are doing well right now because they're able to, to get goods and services more quickly. But again, it only takes one or two components. If you look at the automotive industry, right, they're, they're 
they're now looking at substitutions for for chips and things like mm -hmm. that to get their products out. But you know, the folks that do have supply here uh, in, in North America are benefiting and and are seeing you know increases in, in their revenue. So you look at yeah. the pulp and paper industry where they get their 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 raw material trees from the from you know forests not far away. They're able to produce and make good profit. While you know your auto manufacturers they're struggling because you know their chips and things are coming from sources outside of the country. Yeah, uh, I've been I've been uh, uh, during the, over the last year uh, working on a renovation project for a for a house uh, near the beach. And one of the maddening things is that I I feel like. If, if I went to the supplier of whatever product it was and said, okay, I need to buy this, uh, what, what are my choices? And they said, well, we've got one that might take six to 12 months from China, or I've got this other one, which isn't exactly what you want, but I can get it to you within a week because it's supplied domestically. Which one do you want? I would know how to make that decision. But the, to me, the frustration is I don't think that the, the companies that are providing the goods and services are, are as aware of their own limitations as they should be. What do you, what do you think? I would agree with that. I think, you know, having, you know, understanding your supply chain and being able to communicate where it is and providing your customers options to say, hey, you know what, you may want product A, but we do have product B and it's a, it's a reasonable substitution and it's locally sourced, you know, might be a little bit more expensive than, 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 than what it is, you know, it can, you, you can really help your bottom line that way. And we're really working with our clients to help them align some of the, some of those areas. You know, you think about cabinet makers, right, for, for your renovation. A lot of cabinets are made overseas. They're all, all suspect. Well, they're going to be on the water for 16 weeks. While a local manufacturer might be more expensive, but you may get it in less time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're talking about advising your 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 companies and it sounds like a combination of short and long term solutions. Uh, you know what what do you and and there's an unpredictability to to the demand side of it as well. How how do you how do you approach those problems when you come into a to one of your customers? Well, you know, for for us, you know, it really is kind of di distinguishing what you can do in the short term and what you can do in the long term. And you're not going to be able to move your supply base, you know, overnight. So putting together a strategy on where you are going to, you know, get your your raw materials from it, uh, it is important, and diversifying that, you know, the push in the in the late 90s, early 2000s to do low country cost sourcing has really caused a bit of this issue because the supply chains all sort of elongated, and then the depression of inventory has really, you know been in just in the just in time philosophy. So what we've been telling our clients in the short term is to think about those products where you do need to have a little bit of inventory. Now we don't want to do what some of the retailers have done, which is they bring in a whole bunch of inventory. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to you want to be balanced and, and it's about striking that right balance between too much and too little and making those decisions. And and you know having the right models, right? So companies have been using supply and demand models for years. And you know those models you can just throw out the window. They're they're huh. they're, they're not they're not right. going to apply right now. And you really need to think about each of these cases in in their unique sense and, and start to reapply the and create new models for the environment in shorter terms. So in the short so, term we, we really work on their models. In the long yeah. term we look at their overall supply chain and and how are they going to really get the goods that they need to run their facilities. So you're you're really advising all of your customers to take a, a fresh look. At their entire supply chain. That's right. If you if you were doing what you were doing a year ago, or even maybe in some cases six months ago, you're doing the wrong thing, right? And and so you really need to 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 be in the moment and think about your risks and different scenarios because it is 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 so different, right? You know, in the last two months, you know, gas prices have gone from 550 per therm up to where it is now and around eight dollars. That's a huge swing. So how do you plan for that? How do you address that in your models and, and make sure that you you're, you're putting that in correctly when you're ordering your materials and preparing your for your customers needs? So let me turn that around a little bit, because a lot of the people uh, I think who who uh, frequent this this podcast are bankers and we're looking at credit risk. So if you were a, a, a lender evaluating the credit risk of a company, what what questions do you think that that should be asked in evaluating the risks of, of their supply chain? Well, I think there, there's really two things that that, you know, I as a credit person, I'd really want to understand one. How, how are these companies really planning? Right. How frequent is their cycle? What inputs are they using in order to make decisions on their purchases? Right. 
their their inventory levels, and then how often are they really evaluating their pricing models, right? You know, you look at at companies that are struggling right now, and what you discover is that companies that have been increasing their prices on a routine basis and have those processes in place are doing better than the companies that haven't really increased their prices at the right thing. So it's, I would ask the questions are, you know, what is your pricing models? How are you really looking at those? And then how are you planning? How, how are you looking at your inventory levels? How are you predicting what your demand will be? How are you managing your supply and making sure that those sort of frequencies are higher than they were, say, pre pre-pandemic, because you have to be more agile in the environment that we're in today. It, it, it seems there's no choice. So, so Barry, like, you know, being in the banking world, when you're thinking about the credit and, and sort of the liquidity, you know, one of the issues that my my customers really face is, is really about, will there be ample liquidity for me to finance my inventory? You know, because I'm going to have to have more inventory than I had before. I'm going to have sometimes before I, I reposition all my mm -hmm. suppliers, it's going to be on the water longer. What are you, what are you seeing out there in terms of, of liquidity and really the access yeah. to capital for some of these manufacturing companies? No, it's it's a really relevant question. I was I, I was just looking at some some uh, asset based market data, and you know ABL data tracks very directly with working capital levels, and so it, I think it's a good good benchmark. But through the course of this year, we've seen uh, record levels of 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 uh, syndicated issuance. It's not new borrowers; it's mostly existing borrowers upsizing their facility. And so, why are they doing that? Well, inflation and slowdown in turn of working capital is leading to more working capital inside these companies and they need to upsize their facility in order to be able to take advantage of it if they've if they've tapped out because the the collateral is now greater than their facility they have suppressed availability and you're seeing uh, uh, just a, a great deal of the existing asset based borrowers upsize to do that they're also asking for leniency on uh, categories of inventory that might have been more challenging like uh, in transit, things on the water, increasing the baskets for those, and it's it's a little challenging for for banks to do it, but it's not impossible if you can if you can really get your arm around the risk of it. So those those requests are coming in, and that's a that's the absolute cheapest source of of capital for those companies in in the current environment because you've got uh, all the other markets have gapped out so much wider. The bank funding, if you can access it, is going to be your cheapest alternative. The other thing that I think is really interesting to take a look at is uh, uh, the interest rates. I mean, the spreads may not have widened, at least measurably, they haven't changed much, but the underlying, the SOFR is up dramatically and is still going up. So the, in, the expense, the interest expense of carrying the working capital is, might, is quite a bit greater, especially since utilization levels are higher. It's good for banks because their interest income is higher. But it's not good for the companies, which are now having more interest expense. And I, I think a lot of companies are going to start taking a, a much sharper look at uh, other alternatives, uh, supply chain uh, type financings, uh, where they can extend their terms uh, or maybe get some off balance sheet terms be exactly because of the, uh, the, the impact on, on interest coverage and, and leverage uh, capacity. No, I, I think that, you know, when I talked about pricing being, you know, one of those things that people on the credit side really need to look at, you know, when you're paying those higher interest rates and and, and looking at it, you know, you got to factor that into your costs and you got to factor that in because it's not a, a de minimis expense when you're looking at, at, at some of these inventories that are out there. No, that's absolutely right. I do think, though, that utilization levels have gone up dramatically and there's some there's some data to support that, but that they probably are are peaking just like I think inflation ultimately peaks. I think the inventory levels, I'm sorry, the utilization levels go down uh, as as you get into, uh, as inflation abates and, the, and the, the cost of the working capital goes down and the, and the, the pace of it picks up. So we may, we may be at a bit of a secular peak in terms of utilization levels. Um, but it, like I said, it's, it's good and bad for the banks. It's a credit challenge, but it's also, um, uh, it's, it's a boon in terms of interest income. Um, you know, uh, we're recording this. I'll timestamp it. And everybody will know, but it's you know, it's the 16th, and it's and it's uh, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, and it looks like the uh, the the rail strike uh, has been uh, abated or deferred. I'm not sure. Well, time will tell by the time we air this. But let's talk a little bit about how bad that would be if we actually got to a, a rail strike uh, in the in the current environment. Well, you know, it, 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 you know, on the energy side, it's been quite volatile and, and prices have been going up. And on the transportation side, like I talked about, you know, containers were quite expensive. 
But, you know, one of the bright spots that we have seen was in transportation, right? You know, spot rates from January of this year uh, per mile were about $2.70 per mile uh, to move goods in, 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 a, in a truck. And now they're about $1.90 on, on the spot market. market. If rail were to go on strike and you were to start to jam up, you know, the rail system, you know, those prices would go, I think, beyond, you know, $2.70 a mile. And you would just see that the trucking, you know, the loads go back to, you know, probably even higher rates where they were in January of 12 loads for every truck. So now it's about three loads for every truck. You know, you, you'd start to see that go even higher because, you know, rail moves a lot of goods, especially grains and, 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 and petrochemicals and things like this. And not having that that outlet for a while would be devastating. And again, elongating that supply chain would bring, you know, factories to slow down because they don't have their raw materials. Mm -hmm. And again, the transportation rates would just skyrocket again. And where we were seeing easing there. And so it would be an inopportune time, especially in transportation, if the rail uh, 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 industry were to go on strike. But again, if I'm a railroad worker, this is the perfect time to apply that pressure yeah, because I yeah. know that. And whatever they they get out of this contract, I'm sure, and I'm sure it's you know they're they're using their leverage. It's it, it that's an inflationary impact all by itself, and we'll feel the the effect of that uh, for for the length of the contract for for sure. Sure. Steve, one more one more question for you. Take your crystal ball out. I mean, we, we kind of talked about what what's what's causing it and what the what the options are for company. But give me a five to ten year view on where do you what do you think will be different as a result of all of this? Well, I think that that companies are going to continue to look at their overall supply chain, right, and be a little bit more creative, right. So you had supply chains, you know, go to China and and they've migrated you know, from kind of, you know, Mexico to China. And I think now, you know, we're, we'll see a little bit more diverse. I think we'll see more domestic manufacturing. I mean, you know, I've been listening to to the politicians saying, hey, do we have enough domestic manufacturing for chips and things like that? And so I think there's going to be some, some more uh, manufacturing that's brought back, you know, at least within North America. And, and I think you're going to see some balancing there of both, you know, trade internationally and domestically and some leveling around, you know, around the, around you know labor and where things are made, and I think it's going to be a little bit more diversified. I also think that inventory levels are probably going to be you know not just in time, not where they were you know back in the in the 70s and 80s, but there's going to be a mid a midpoint where people are going to have enough to service customers, but maybe a little bit more than just that just in time inventory. So I think we're going to still be a little bit higher in terms of our cost profiles and where where we were pre pandemic, but I think that inflation will abate and will come down over over time because otherwise if we continue down this 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 route it, it could be very interesting from an economic divide, uh, environment yeah. I, interesting is that's the we'll, we'll we'll end on that steve before before we end i i just uh, I, because you're the hilco representative on the call i want to thank you uh, and your your friends at, at hilco global for sponsoring the in the know podcast it's been great partnership and uh, glad to have your expertise on but i really appreciate the sponsorship no, Barry, I mean, you've been doing a great job with these podcasts. I know lots of people have been listening to them and really just appreciate your time in organizing them. And, and you know, Hilco is very proud to sponsor you, 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 knew you on these efforts and some very interesting topics that are highly relevant uh, for, you know, the Secure Finance Network. That's great. Thanks so much. I think we'll, we'll end it there. Thanks, Steve. All right. Thank you, Barry. Really appreciate your time and, and having me on today. Pleasure. Well, thanks again to Steve Tanzi, the president of Hilco Global Solutions, for his on the spots perspectives on supply chain issues and how they're advising their clients. I think there's few things more topical than supply chain issues right now. Uh, it's very dynamic for every industry. Uh, the labor, energy, transportation issues, all driven by rapidly changing demand patterns, how companies adapt to them. It seems the, the, the major challenge for, for every business right now. Uh, the current issues seem inevitable that they will lead to changes in how companies design, source, and manufacture their goods, as well as how they get them to market. It's the, it's the short-term as well as the long-term implications that I think are the really interesting discussion, and Steve really covered it well. I, I would pay special attention to Steve's insights for the credit issues and how, how you should, as a lender, be evaluating supply chain issues in the short and long-term and, uh, and, and calculate them as you, as you evaluate potential credit risks. Thank you again to the Secured Finance Network team for all their support on the In The Know podcast. And I already thank Steve 
from Global, Hilco Global, but I'll thank again, thank you Hilco Global for their sponsorship of the podcast series.